Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the professor, and this is the moment of truth. You know, it's getting harder and harder to find anyone who's backing the badge these days. Marjorie Taylor Greene was bragging just last year that she flew into D.C., no doubt on her broomstick, just so she could vote to oppose the George Floyd Police Accountability Act. And her rationale? Because something something BLM, something something Antifa defund the police. Oh, but what a difference a year makes. Or rather, the police going after a white person makes, because today Green's screeching a different tune. She wants to defund the FBI. And she's not alone. Her fellow escapee from the loony bin, Paul Gozar, was also ranting that the FBI must be destroyed. Though to be fair, Paul Gosar didn't just discover his hatred for federal law enforcement just this week. In fact, this guy's got a years-long record of things that he's been trying to defund, from the UN to the Capitol Hill Police. I'm not making that last one up, by the way. Last year, Gozar tried to slip an amendment into a legislative funding bill that would have blocked funding to the Capitol Hill Police. That is, until his absurdly nihilistic demands were met. You probably didn't hear much about that one, but to be fair, Paul Gozar, just like Marjorie Taylor Greene, he says so much stupid, crazy stuff, it pretty much gets lost in the shuffle. And there's no need to worry, though, that Greene or Gozar or any others from the GOP's clown car of crazies will get in trouble with their constituents or with the right-wing hate media. Because everybody understands that when these people say back the badge, what that means is white police who kill black people. That's all it means. Everyone understands it's a racial code word. Their phony orgy of supporting police was actually them supporting the police, being able to kill black people with impunity. Everybody understood that, so it was inevitable that this would happen. White supremacy's only principles are situational ethics. Whatever seems to support their power in the moment, for the next five minutes, that's what they'll get behind. And then they'll switch to the exact opposite five minutes from now, if needs be. Whatever they opposed yesterday, they'll support today. And they don't have to worry about contradicting themselves because, as Neely Fuller said, white supremacy believes in taking both sides of the conversation. But this latest about-face from the white right was so jarring and sudden that even morons like Dan Abrams had to call it out, however raggedly. Oh, the irony! For the last year and a half or so, the white right's been going on an orgy of performative extremism, trying to propose laws that say the police can't be prosecuted, you can't even touch the police, why? You can't even speak disrespectfully to the police. And then those same white right-wingers support and protect and stand by thugs who beat the police to the point that some of them died. But of course, everyone knows this isn't about the police. It's about encouraging and defending anti-black violence. Notice how these guys want to defund the police and attack the cops on January 6th not because anyone died or because a corrupt prosecutor refused to charge a clearly guilty thug with a badge, but rather they wanted to protect the January 6th rioters because an election didn't go their way, and more recently because Trump got a surprise visit from the FBI after months of them telling him that they were coming to dinner. The response from the white right is disproportionate, and that's because they are not actually oppressed. They don't have anything to actually be unhappy about or even displeased about. So that's the reason why it's so easy for them to fly off the handle and go ballistic over nothing. They don't have anything to be unhappy about. No one was killed at Mar-a-Lago last week. No one was wounded or injured. Hell, nobody's feelings even got hurt. But now there's been one guy who went to the FBI Cincinnati field office with a nail gun, and no, he wasn't there to do any home improvements. He's dead now. But since then, you've also had some AR-15 wielding punks in Arizona, that's Paul Gozard's stomping grounds, staking out FBI field offices there. Gee, I wonder if anyone's figured out the connection. You know, when the orange man was in the presidential office, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions the third invented an imaginary category of black people that he called black identity extremists. You have white supremacists on a tear for the last 18 months, and neither Biden nor Merrick Garland are talking a syllable about white identity extremists, something that actually exists. Preserving the principle of racial immunity from law is more important than preserving their own lives, is what this tells us. And that makes a certain amount of sense. Were it not for immunity from law, Trump and Biden's misbegotten brat Hunter would have both had matching prison cells a long time ago. Racial immunity from law is why Lauren Boebert and her husband aren't both in the hootscow right now. It's one of the primary tangible benefits that white supremacy bestows on those who it classifies as white. 
Tangible benefits are the glue that a system uses to incentivize people to uphold and defend that system. The problem the white left is having right now is that they never wanted to accept that the system of racial immunity goes way beyond getting you out of traffic tickets or keeping and preventing the police from harassing you. Racial immunity from law also extends to every part of the legal system and every type of crime. Brock Turner rapes a woman. The judge admits, yeah, he did it, but let him go. Racial immunity from law. Drew Clinton also raped a woman, and the judge lets him go for the exact same reason, racial immunity from law. 10,000 white supremacists attacked the Capitol last year, and only one Capitol Hill police officer decided to use the necessary amount of force to defend the members of Congress. Why? Racial immunity from law. It's the same reason that so many of the January 6 rioters are getting slaps on the wrist and many are now running for public office. When you decide that you're going to pick and choose when the law will apply based solely on race, then you create an entire category of people who the law doesn't apply to, under any circumstances. Oh, it may seem cute to do that racial immunity from law thing when some suburbanite's trying to get out of a DUI. They don't have much of a problem with it then. But it stops being cute when people use their racial immunity from law to commit rapes, murders, or even to attempt to overthrow the country. Now, when stuff like that happens, that's when the white left realizes, gee, you need a functioning system of laws. But instead, all they've got is a system of racial immunity, and that immunity doesn't stop just because the fate of the nation depends on it. I told you about how exactly a hundred years ago Adolf Hitler carried out the Beer Hall Push, which was a coup attempt. People died, including police. Now, the German government had a choice. Punish this guy or give him a slap on the wrist. They decided to give him a slap on the wrist. Many of the individuals who helped Hitler to try to carry out his beer hall coup would, in fact, go on to be the head of the Nazi party. Imagine that. They could have stopped the Nazi party before it even began. But, of course, they didn't. Germany's fate depended on whether the law was the law. And because white fiat ruled, the Weimar Republic fell. And nine years later, so did all of Germany. Racial immunity from law doesn't stop being the law simply because the fate of the nation depends on it. Just because you desperately need for it to stop, that's not going to be what stops it. The police at all levels have played footsie with these racists. This is, to an extent, white supremacists eating their own, what we've been seeing from the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Paul Gozarts. Police loved it when the white rights said back the badge and make excuses for the murders they committed. And the FBI, by the way, they thought they were immune, but the Bureau has problems with white supremacists as well, and they haven't done anything about it. It's ironic that the same FBI, who released a report in 2006 saying that most American law enforcement were infested with white supremacists, never decided to do an assessment of their own white supremacist infiltration. Apparently, the FBI feels that they're immune to white supremacists, or perhaps they want to be a last bastion for them. The same FBI who time and again said there was nothing they could do about all those white supremacists with badges who were murdering black people, and now that same FBI are targets of the political supporters and cheerleaders of those same racist murderous cops. The lesson here is that inaction in the face of white supremacist aggression is not a victimless crime. The FBI should have gone beyond their one-and-done report about white extremists in the police departments and instead began agitating to infiltrate and go after those police. But they didn't. So now the FBI is finding out the hard way that there is no honor among thieves. And there's no gratitude either. Good day, and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Cloud Walker Z., Jacques Hargett, Calvin Benjamin, Loke Thies, and Richie Lazar. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black empowerment only exists because of you.